how do you know if an expert is giving you good advice? That's that's a really complicated and and hard question, and you don't always know. You know, and and in in Escape from Democracy, you know, some of the some, we give some suggestions that might help us know when we can trust experts, or at least make make expertise more widely trustable. Um, uh, we we are not arguing against experts. Obviously, as you say, I mean, expertise is is how we build hotels like the one that I'm in right now, or um, airplanes like I'll be flying on tomorrow. We need those sort. Of, obviously, you know. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, especially in the realm of policy expertise and economic policy um, being implemented over the hopes and desires of the people who are being ruled, um, uh, you know, then I think this awareness problem or uh, suggestion is an important one. And um, I think it's important to, to have some uh, mechanisms that, again, aren't a panacea, but at least help alleviate the problem of uh, different motivations between the experts and those consuming expertise. So I'm Sandra Peart. I'm Dean of the Jepson School of Leadership Studies at the University of Richmond, an economist who studied at the University of Toronto. So much happened in the 19th century and 19th century political economy. I think it's one of the most fascinating periods in economics. Um, it was a time in which people thought about the big questions of economics, um, you know, why are we rich, why are we poor, how do we get out of poverty, how do we develop, how do people make good choices, how do we fix institutions so that everyone has access to the same kinds of choices and so on. There were huge reforms happening, huge economic events were happening, and uh, just so many ideas, those of John Stuart Mill, of course, on whom I've worked a lot, but Smith's ideas come into the 19th century and get worked on and, and made more rich and so on and, and put into practice in the 19th century. So it's just, and then you come to the end of the century and such huge changes both economically and in terms of intellectual thinking happen. So it's just a fascinating period. Analytical egalitarianism is something that David Levy and I have coined as a phrase to describe the idea that at least for the, the purposes of thinking about economics and economic policy making, um, people are equally equipped uh, to make political and economic choices. Uh, and if that's the case, then the differences we observe in outcomes so, of course, there are lots of different outcomes uh, that we observe. Those are not due to innate uh, or natural differences amongst us, but instead are at least mainly the result of uh, history, luck, education, opportunities. Uh, so that's how we talk about and, and use the idea of analytical egalitarianism. So uh, the role of, we've written, David and I have written on the role of experts in policymaking. And it, it, as we've thought about this, it's really an extension of the notion of public choice economics. So Buchanan says, okay, policymakers, the state can't be, we shouldn't assume that the state is this benevolent despot out there looking out for all of our best interests. Uh, but instead, people who are in government are, no more, but also no less self-interested than we are. Um, and what David and I have done with that insight is we've said, okay, you know, yes, that's something that's ex it's accepted now in the economics literature. Um, uh, but uh, where we haven't applied that kind of insight is to the notion of policymakers as and experts who are advising them. Uh, and what we have argued is that policy that experts who advise governments, uh, who put uh, policy into effect uh, are, uh, as Buchanan might say, no less, no nor more, no less, no, nor no more self-interested than the rest of us. So if we look at what experts do within society, we should be aware as ordinary people, at, at least be aware of the fact that they may not always have our best interests at, at heart. The question is, do, do experts then have neutral and, and only scientific objectives? Um, and um, 
it's possible that they do, but it's also possible that they, as self-interested individuals, have their own interests uh, that they're taking into account. So their motivations um, uh, are a mixture, a messy mixture of self and public interests. Uh, and uh, we, David and I, in our work in, in um, the, the book on experts, we have have thought it important to look at historical examples where experts actually put their own interests ahead of those they were um, looking, supposedly looking after. Um, and so we look at eugenics, for instance, or the Soviet economic growth uh, uh, literature and so on. Uh, and, and we use those historical examples to, to try to demonstrate then that there have been some catastrophic effects that resulted when uh, people simply trusted experts without being aware of or thinking about the incentives and the motivations that they face. Our notion is not so much that experts are dishonest um, or that they're thwarting the law. So although that, you know, clearly that happens, but we're not particularly interested in that. What we're more interested in is simply um, cases where ex experts receive a directive um, to, you know, put a policy into place, uh, and then um, they, you know, go ahead and start doing that uh, without any uh, additional checks to see whether this is in fact what the people who are being ruled, you know, would agree to. Uh, so without consent. So consent is a, an important um, uh, idea that we talk about in the book, um, and and so there's that. And then secondly, there, there are situations in which experts may, uh, may selectively report data, for instance. Not necessarily an illegal thing to do, but they haven't made the full data array available, or they haven't said that here are some additional models that we tested, um, or, you know, thinking about, again, to go to the Soviet example, um, you know, finding ways to explain why the data don't actually fit the model. Um, so, you know, saying, well, you know, yes, Soviets are, we, we still think the model is that Soviets are growing faster than the United States economy. Um, however, the data don't show that. And here are some reasons why, you know, the model isn't failing, but the prediction has failed. On the part of an expert, um, you know, um, finding ways to make the expert's own viewpoint actually still hold um, salience uh, for the public. Um, you can think of examples, you know, in the, in the last few years with respect to COVID and reporting and, and uh, you know, not making the full array of uncertainty um, available to the public or at least known to the public, but simply saying, you know, here's what we know and here's what we predict um, and, you know, lots of those predictions were incorrect. It's not that they're, they're getting income. Um, you know, they're, as, as I said earlier, we're not suggesting that they're taking bribes or they're doing something uh, illegal, but they're, uh, they're not, um, they're so um, struck by the goal or adhering to the goal that they're getting, you know, to go forward with implementing that as opposed to unwinding something that they see as incorrect or that people haven't agreed to or whatever. So it's a sort of self-interested behavior. Um, I don't know exactly how to describe what they're getting out of it, uh, but, you know, some sort of self-worth or self-satisfaction. So Adam Smith says, you know, everybody is motivated by things, by goods and so on, but also by fame, fame and fortune. And fame is something that we as economists don't really spend a lot of time talking about, um, but you know, self-worth or, or you know, something prestige uh, would be the way we would talk about it today. But people, I think Adam Smith had an insight there that you know, was one that we should actually retrieve from the 18th century because people are motivated by fortune and, and fame, um, so these two dimensions that aren't actually commensurate. Um, it's not like you can translate fame directly into dollars. There's sort of a relationship, but uh, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. So, you know, some of the work that David and I have done has related to um, how to make sure that we do adhere to these kinds of expectations. So expectations about ethical behavior and so on are ways to kind of think about 
constraining experts, at least to the extent that they buy in and then comply with them, buy into and then comply with, with such, such expectations. Um, they're not, you know, codes of ethics are not, there's no panacea, and they're not a panacea, um, but they might be something that would be helpful. Um, and again, it's, you know, sometimes we talk about awareness. It's, it's having a code of ethics as a way of, of ensuring that people on both sides of the problem, you know, those who are consuming expertise and those who are producing expertise are aware that there are motivations that don't always align. How do you know if an expert is giving you good advice? That's, that's a really complicated and, and hard question, and you don't always know, you know, and, and in, in Escape from Democracy, you know, some of the, some, we give some suggestions that might help us know when we can trust experts, or at least make, make expertise more widely trustable. Um, uh, we, we are not arguing against experts. Obviously, as you say, I mean, expertise is, is how we build hotels like the one that I'm in right now or um, airplanes like I'll be flying on tomorrow. We need those sort of, obviously. You know. um, uh, at the same time, uh, especially in the realm of policy expertise and economic policy um, being implemented over the hopes and desires of the people who are being ruled, um, uh, you know, then I think this awareness problem or uh, suggestion is an important one. And um, I think it's important to, to have some uh, mechanisms that, again, aren't a panacea, but at least help alleviate the problem of uh, different motivations between the experts and those consuming expertise. Uh, and so, you know, we talk in the book about competition, for instance, you know, just having lots of expertise out there that is not always, um, you know, in the same tribe. Um, so always coming from this, you know, the same sort of point of view. So different points of view. Um, and uh, I mentioned James Buchanan a while ago, um, and I'll just mention him one more time because he uh, talked about how we have, we economists, um, and he included himself in this, obviously, uh, have an ethical obligation to look at the world through different windows, use the, the metaphor of windows. And, and uh, you know, I don't think we do that very often as economists. Uh, we kind of have our notion, uh, it might be efficiency, it might be you know, economic growth, uh, whatever, as a sort of exogenously determined goal. Uh, and then we do whatever it takes, supposedly, to, you know, to attain that goal. Um, and, and there are many different viewpoints um, that we then simply, you know, aren't, aren't taking into account. We're not looking into different windows. Uh, so I think this, you know, that notion, it's a little bit uh, uh, idealistic, but, you know, to suppose that we could all force ourselves to look through different windows or, or um, uh, whatever, but, it, but it's, it's, uh, it's something to aspire to, at least. I'm somewhat optimistic, um, a, an optimistic person, I think, and, and uh, so you know there there are ways we can improve on the margin. Um, we're we're not going to have experts uh, or policymakers uh, or economists who just suddenly you know become different people. Yeah, I'm, I'm an analytical egalitarian. I think we're basically sort of the same, you know, combination of messy motives that we used to be in the 19th century and and now are in the 21st century. Um, uh, so we have to take people as they are, right, and then think about ways to use their expertise, put their expertise to our best use, um, and make sure that we're not relying, we're not unaware and relying in an unaware way in uh, expertise that um, uh, is, is um, faulty or is being driven by the expert's own uh, self-interest and, and desire to obtain prestige. You know, one of the ways then, yeah, I mentioned competition earlier, but another way then to um, help uh, obtain um, awareness and, and self-awareness uh, and uh, more neutral, less biased um, expertise uh, and expert advice is to enforce transparency on the expert. So both in terms of um, data um, selection and collection and so on make make those widely available so that the results can be checked 
uh, and also then in terms of modeling. Um, so, you know, reporting on models that have not been used um, as much as those that were uh, actually used at the end, uh, in the end, I think is a really important sort of notion for economists to uh, embrace. So the jury system is extremely interesting in our view, and, and one that, uh, yes, has, uh, uh, has implications for, I, th I think, for um, the broader notion of expertise and, and experts. It's got opposing viewpoints. Everyone knows that the viewpoints are opposed um, in terms of the legal system. Um, there's transparency. Documents are made available. Uh, and the jury system is one that's randomly chosen, you know, the jury, the group, is randomly chosen. We, uh, David and I, have argued that, you know, the random choice of experts is actually, or decision makers, uh, is actually one that, that um, hasn't had enough play in society uh, and, you know, might be, um, might be available for some other institutional arrangements. Um, uh, so leadership by, you know, choosing ran random lots and so on, which as a leadership scholar, I, th I find that quite interesting. And it works experimentally. There's some experimental work that um, I've done that, that suggests that actually, you know, it, as long as people do feel that they and believe, and it's, and it's belief based on probabilities, that they have equal um, opportunity to be the leader, then uh, a random choice of leaders can actually get you some really good, interesting results. I started today talking about the 19th century and you know John Stuart Mill is really a central figure in the in the 19th century and the uh, uh, the, the a little book that I wrote the essential John Stuart Mill um, caused me to revisit his ideas and I think that his work on the harm principle really gives us a blueprint for how to think about this notion of of public good, if you want to put it that way, um, because as, as, is, he's, as he's very famous for having said, you know, there are some actions that uh, are, are uh, other regarding, and then there are some that are self-regarding. And self-regarding actions are, you know, not all that interesting, frankly, because we live in a social world. But other regarding or socially important actions are ones that sometimes impose harms on other people. And he then goes on to talk about, well, you know, what do we do about that as a society? Um, and when sh might there be a role for a state and when might there not be? And it's what's really interesting about it is he recognizes that if we constrain people from, um, from acting a certain way, from having particular choices open to them uh, or not, that, that too imposes a harm on individuals because people need a rich array of choices in order to flourish, um, in order to figure out what kind of person they want to be and then try to become that person. Uh, and so if we're, we know we're going to impose a harm if we constrain them. And so then we have to balance that or think about that known harm to um, it, as it relates to a potential harm that might happen if, for instance, I don't wear a mask um, and you don't wear a mask, and then you know one of us infects the other with a, a you know a, a, an illness, um, and so you know we've got a possible slight probability of imposing a harm. But then, we, on the other hand, we've got a harm that is imposed if we restrict, you know, impose a, a, a mask mandate or something like that. Uh, and so it, it just it gives us a framework. He doesn't give us the answer. He doesn't say, so therefore there will not be mask mandate or there will be mask mandates. But he's, he's giving us this framework to help us think in a very nuanced way about when we should, might, as a society, restrict people's liberty and when we might allow them uh, to you know, make their choices, even though they might harm themselves or someone else uh, in the future. So, I think Mill is a fascinating person. I'll just mention quickly, you know, his notion, his his work on women and uh, extending the franchise to women and marriage, and recognizing, you know, some just really important, um, uh, uh, very early recognition of of the difficulty that it. Uh, occurs within a marriage if a woman can't own property outside a marriage. Um, 
Uh, and then, of course, extending the franchise to the laboring class, what were called the laboring classes. Uh, and then his work on, uh, on um, uh, the, the formerly enslaved people and, you know, and, and thinking about Jamaica and so on and talking about how it was so important that those, those um, persons in Jamaica received the same protection of law that a person in Britain would have. Um, and uh, so the governor air controversy and so on, all of that's in the, the essential mill. So look it up. <laughs>